Well, we're in a series called Upfit. We're about to, if you walk down the back hallway, you'll see it's rather barren. We are stripping, uh, starting the earliest phases in a remodeling project, a renovation project that's going to encompass the bottom floor here at Calvary, not the sanctuary, but everything outside of the sanctuary. And because that renovation was coming, I was looking at some parallels in the scripture and began to think about a series of messages, this being the fifth of six, that just deal with the renovation that takes place within our own hearts as the Holy Spirit goes to work inside of us. You see, God has committed himself not just to saving us. It's not just a transactional thing that happened. I apply my grace, you're saved, you're going to heaven, we're done. No, no. The Holy Spirit comes to accomplish his work and complete his work in us. And it's an ongoing thing. Paul says it this way, and it's been the theme of our entire series. The outer man is wasting away, but the inner man is being renewed day by day. Day. There is an ongoing work of the Spirit. And so we've been looking at that over the last, this is our fifth week. And so just in, in review, week one, it really comes down to this. We accept the fact that God plans to renovate our lives and wants to be working in our lives every single day. Are you with me so far on that? Okay. Two. Week two. We begin with vision, but our vision is not enough. We need a revision. We need a revisioning. We need God's vision. We need to be pursuing what he has created us to be, not what we think we should be. We have to supplant our own vision, our own dreams, and follow after his. And in so doing, we discover what we never would have known if we'd followed our own path. When we submit ourselves, when we surrender ourselves to the Lord, that means, Lord means, his way. So it's his Vision. And whenever you're doing renovation, you've got to have a vision before you even begin, right? You've got to know what it's going to look like. Otherwise, that renovation is going to be an absolute mess. So we go to the visioning phase. First, or or the, third, the third week. Then we've got to start with demolition. What has to come out so the new can come in? And in renovation, you always have a demolition phase. You're taking out walls, you're taking out flooring, you're, you're changing wall coverings, you're, you're moving, sometimes you're adding a wing, you're putting on a second story. And so in all of that, there's a lot of stuff that has to be torn out. And the Holy Spirit works in our lives to demolish, to pull out those things which need to go. We, Colossians 3, we put off and we put on. So demolition is all about understanding, listening to the voice of the Spirit saying, what is there in my life that is hindering the ongoing work of God in my life? And that has to go. If you're a man and you struggle with pornography, that has to go. If you're a woman and you're struggling with honesty, that has to go. Doesn't matter what it is, if there's something in your life that is inhibiting the ongoing work of God in you, it has to go. That's the demolition phase. It's got to be gone. And as long as you don't, as long as you don't get rid of those things, as long as you don't cast them out, as long as you don't renounce the things of darkness, you're not going to see any new work going on in your life because it would be a complete waste of time. And it wouldn't be right. As a matter of fact, it would be somewhat of a mess. So we accept the fact that God has a plan to renovate our lives. We begin with his vision. We start then with demolition. And then when we go through demolition, when we start pulling stuff out, we start discovering stuff. We find out that that faucet that leaked for all of those years was undermining the subfloor. You been there? We find black mold behind the walls. You been there? We find out that the foundations are not adequate to take us to the next level. So we have a work to do after demolition to shore up and establish that the foundations are in place so that the new construction can go uh, on according to God's plan. So we have to, we have to, what should I say? Strengthen and expand the foundations. And the foundations are established by the word of God. Psalm 19, Psalm 119. Work your way through those, those psalms and you will understand how foundational the word of God is to our lives. So that reestablishes the foundation and expands the foundation. You can only build. 
you can only build up after you have built down. You've got to sink. It's like the tree. The roots go down so it can support the tree as it goes up. He will be, David said, in, the psalmist says in, in Psalm 1, he will be like a tree planted by rivers of living water and then his leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does prosper. Everything that grows out of that starts with the fact that he is planted. So foundation. Today we got to start talking about construction now. We've, we've done all of this work to get to the place where we can say, okay, go to work in my life, Jesus. Pull out the hammer and gather the materials and go to work in me. Now, there's a principle you need to understand. No matter where you are in life or how much of a mess you feel like your life is or how much work you think needs to be done, understand this. God always starts where you are. He starts where you are. He may take you back, but he starts where you are. You don't have to get it all fixed up and then come to God and say, I'm ready. He wants you to come to him and say, I'm ready. And God will say, okay, I see you right where you are. You know, he actually reaches for people who have got all kinds of mess in their life. He meets them right there in the middle of the mess. God doesn't stand off and just say, you know, I can't. <laughs> I just can't. It's just too bad. You get yourself straightened up a little bit and I will open my arms to receive you. Can you imagine? No parent would do that, would they? No, what God does is he comes into the midst of our mess and he meets us there. He always starts where you are. Well, we know this. We kind of know this. The wiring can't go in until the subfloor is down and the studs are in place and the framing is, is worked out. If you haven't got that, you haven't got the structure to hang the wiring, so it doesn't work. Paint must wait. You don't decorate until the dust is finished. You watch a renovation taking place and you won't find them unloading the truck from, I was going to say Toys R Us, but I mean rooms to go. They're kind of the same. They're kind of the same, and I think they I think they both have the same credit card. But they don't unload the the, the the furniture from rooms to go while the paint and the dust and the and the mess and the, the sheetrock mud is is going. They wouldn't do that. They don't want that in the way. It's it's not time. So what do you do? You have to take it step by step. But God always starts where you are. He's the master builder, patient methodical. We're the only ones apt to rush before it's ready. We rush before it's ready. Jesus taught from parables. Paul said of the Old Testament, it's given to us as an example. Two places in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse 6 first. Now these things took place as examples for us. And he has just given a long list of the things that happened in the Old Testament. He said these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. And then in verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, listen, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Those of you who like to spend all your time in the New Testament never looking at the old, you are basically turning your back on a picture book that God has given you to illustrate every New Testament truth you can imagine. The Old Testament tells the stories. So let's talk about new construction today by reaching back for some wisdom revealed in Jerusalem 2,600 years ago in the greatest renovation project in the entire Bible. Little background. The year is 586 BC. God allows the Babylonians to be the instrument to punish his people Israel for 500 years of resistance to his will and his revealed plan in the Torah, the law. God's had enough. 586, he says, I'm going to use these people as a tool to punish and to correct my people. I've often described the children of Israel in this manner. 
children of Israel, if you read up until the, um, up until the exile in, in 586, if, if you read the history of after David, the kings that followed and the way that the people continued to walk away from the Lord, as you read your way through all of that, you need to understand they did not just occasionally fall off the wagon. Every once in a while, they found the wagon and got on the wagon. But it was rare. Walk your way, walk your way from Solomon all the way through the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. with Zedekiah. You walk your way through all of those years and see how many times a king leads the people in following the Lord. It's almost negligible for 500 years and 26 kingdoms, most of which were totally corrupt. God was patient with the people, and finally God said, enough. It's a frightening thing when God says enough. Israel was loaded with idols. They were allied with evil partners. They were riddled with corruption, and they were compromised in their worship. But the people, the people were sure. They were absolutely sure that God loved his big, lavish Jerusalem home, the temple, that God loved the temple they built for him so much that he wouldn't allow the temple to be destroyed. Ergo, Jerusalem had to stand to protect the temple. This was their logic. God won't let the temple fall. Therefore, he won't let Jerusalem fall. We'll, let, we'll do what we're going to do. We'll live how we're going to live. We have the temple of the Lord. It's kind of like a get out of jail free card. We know we won't destroy the temple, so we're going to be okay. That's what they said. They thought God would completely overlook their sin and always come to their aid because of the temple. Nobody spoke the truth like the prophets, and the prophet Jeremiah prophesies that the hammer is about to fall. In the seventh chapter of Jeremiah, verses two through four, God says to Jeremiah, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there his word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. God had enough. He said, you keep claiming that I'm not going to do anything because you've got the temple. I don't care about the temple. So he let the dogs loose. And the Babylonians utterly destroyed the city, reducing it to rubble and the temple to ashes. And the survivors of the city, those that could still walk, those who still had those who still had their faculties about them, they were deported to Babylon. They were marched out of their own land all the way around the Fertile Crescent into Babylon, into modern-day Iraq. And there they were held, they were kept within the confines of the Babylonian Empire for 70 years. Jerusalem was left as a smoking ruins with only the dregs and the beggars and, and the very few. There's a city that was so destroyed, so depopulated, that no one wanted to live there. The Jews who escaped deportation lived in the countryside around Jerusalem and in other communities around Jerusalem. They kept a low profile, but their capital was gone, their temple was gone, their identity was gone, their security was gone, everything was gone. But God made a promise to them. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to take you into captivity, but after 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. I don't fully know why it was 70 years. One thing that is striking is when you look back through the lens of history, after their captivity, Israel never again, never again struggled, it seems, with idolatry. Before the captivity, look with all of the kings. What were they always fighting? All of the other gods. All of this idolatry. 
started with Solomon, and after Solomon, it just accelerated. And with every one that every king that came along, they they gave themselves over to more and more idols. Instead of trusting the Lord, they said, "We're going to hedge our bets, and we're going to worship this God and this God and this God and this God." And surely, it, worshiping one of them will hit it right. And God hated this idolatry and he rails against this idolatry. But the people would not cease from their idolatry and trust in the one true God. And so God sends them out of the land away from the influence of the land of Canaan, which is where they picked up this strong idolatry. Sends them away completely for 70 years and breaks the stranglehold that idolatry held upon them. He said, I'm going to send you back. I'm going to send you back, but without idols. It seems the Jews needed a complete removal from the prevailing idolatry that had plagued them for a thousand years. Listen, you might have to just sever ties and move away from the sin that so easily trips you up. If you're going to be serious about walking with the Lord, there are some things that you can't fool with. And for different people, they are different things. You can't even, for some people, you can't even get, what's your kryptonite? There's some stuff you shouldn't even play with. You have a problem with these thoughts or those thoughts. You have, you have problems with this place or that place. Why do you keep going back there? Well, I've kind of got, you've got to sever ties. You have to turn your back. Anytime you say, I'm going to follow Jesus, it means you're going to turn your back on stuff. You can't have it all. You can have it all in him, but you, you can't have it all. You can't have him and the world too. And we want that. We want that. So we tell ourselves if we'll just show up on Sunday, that takes care of the God component, and then we'll just live like we want to for the rest of our lives. And we do. The world looks at us, and they cannot tell a bit of difference between the way a lot of Christians act and the world acts. They look at us, and they can't, they can't tell and we're kind of pleased with ourselves because we've kind of compartmentalized life and we live like we want to live and we show up on Sunday and everything's cool. This is the kind of thing that God sent the children of Israel into captivity over. He said, you're going to have to sever ties with this stuff. You're going to have to stop. So I struggle with pornography. Well, you're going to have to stop. Well, I can't stop. Well, you're going to have to get some help. You're going to have to get accountability. You're going to have to get some people to walk with you. But you've got to understand, you've got to stop. You're not going to show up in heaven with a suitcase and say, Lord, I, I, I just need to bring this stuff with me. Sooner or later, you've got to stop. I just want to say to somebody this morning, stop it. Never thought about it. I'm going to preach a whole message on that sometime. Just stop. Quit. Cut it out. I think, I think it was Bob Newhart that did the comedy thing where he's the, he's the counselor and he sits there so quietly and everything else and the people tell him all the thing and you know he always does monologues so he's responding, those of you who may remember him. He, he's always responding and so people are telling him all of this stuff and he's, being, and he's making notes and everything else and finally he just puts his pen down and he says, stop. That's it. That's the counseling. Stop. God said to Israel for 500 years, a thousand years, stop, 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 stop. And they wouldn't stop. And so he said, I am going to remove you from your environment. I'm going to chasten you by removing you from that which you're comfortable with and putting you in a completely different place that you might be free from the thing that has destroyed you. And so he did. 70 years, and the deported Jews are well integrated into Babylon now, so much so that some of them rise up to powerful, powerful places in the Babylonian administration. Daniel is one of those, with Nebuchadnezzar. You remember Daniel? Daniel becomes a, an official in the Babylonian Empire, second only, second only really to, in, his, in his advisement and in his power to Nebuchadnezzar. So God, God allowed them to rise up in leadership. Well, Daniel's gone, and Babylon rolls on for a while, but all kingdoms must ultimately falter. We don't want to hear that, but all kingdoms, all governments, they ultimately falter. 
and Babylon is overthrown by the Persians. The Persians just step into everything that Babylon is done and they throw out what they don't like and they add some new dimensions and now we're not dealing with the Babylonians, we're dealing with the Persians and the children of Israel are still in captivity. Are you still with me? They're still in captivity, but under the Persians. Now, Isaiah had prophesied more than a century before these things more than a century before, that a ruler named Cyrus would be raised up by God and used of God to deliver the people. And indeed, Isaiah is long dead, and Cyrus, the Persian, steps out of nowhere with a heart to deliver the children of Israel and send them back to their land. He takes an assessment of the Babylonian kingdom that he has taken over. He reverses the strategy of deportation that Babylon employed. He says, we're going to send these ones back and those ones back. We'll give them some help to get started. We're going to pursue a different strategy when it comes to dealing with these people. And he didn't even know that God was using him. In his administration, one of the most powerful men was his cupbearer. He was in charge of making sure that his, his food was safe, but he was more than that. He was a trusted, close advisor. His name was Nehemiah. So when the first Jews who had returned to Israel, Cyrus had sent them out, and so they had gone back, I believe some 50,000 of them had gone back. But when they went back, they began to send messages back to their brothers who were still in Babylon, still in per, now Persia. They started sending messages back saying, don't come back, you won't believe what a mess this is. And when Nehemiah, the cupbearer, we don't know how old he was, we don't know if he uh, was, a, was you know, elevated in age to the point where as a boy he could still remember Jerusalem, or whether he'd been born in captivity, we simply don't know. But when he heard about Jerusalem and the mess in Jerusalem, and the gates being burned with fire and the walls being rubble, when he heard that indeed those people who had gone back had rebuilt their temple, it wasn't nearly as ornate as the one that Solomon built, but they had rebuilt their temple, their house of worship, but everything stopped after that. And so you had a temple sitting in the midst of rubble. It broke his heart. Isn't that the way it is for us? Anyone, anyone struggle here? You've got the, the temple's been rebuilt. You've come to Jesus. You've asked him to be the Lord of your life. He has honored you and moved in. He has literally moved in and established a relationship with you, but your life is still a mess. There's still, you see, work to be done. That's why the Holy Spirit comes, to rebuild the broken down places in our lives. Temple, yeah, got that. But man, it's a mess. So when the word comes back to Nehemiah, he's brokenhearted. They'd rebuilt the temple, but the cities are ruined. That's the long and short of it. It's one of the most compelling stories in all of the Old Testament. And so Nehemiah, at great risk, takes the chance, goes before Cyrus. Cyrus says, why are you so downcast? You've never been downcast in my... In those years, you didn't walk into the emperor's, you know, the emperor's throne room uh, having a bad day. He was allowed to have a bad day. You weren't allowed to have a bad day. In the emperor's throne room, you're happy, 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 and whatever he needs, he has power of life and death. Nehemiah walks in and he says, why are you downcast? You haven't been downcast in my presence before. And Nehemiah says, it's Jerusalem. My heart breaks for Jerusalem. And Cyrus is moved by Nehemiah, or actually it's, the, it's a ruler after Cyrus. Now, I'm sorry, it's Artaxerxes. By now, the rulers have changed. Artaxerxes is moved by Nehemiah, and he says, I'm going to send you back to build those walls. What do you need? This is the way the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. God says, I'm sending my spirit not just to, not just to establish. He establishes the temple. He establishes his temple in you. When you come to that point where you confess your sins, accept the fact that that he is your Savior and your Lord. You begin to follow after him, but the Holy Spirit comes to clean up the rest of it and to set things in a right manner. Nehemiah asks for leave for the renovation and rebuilding of, of Jerusalem, and like all good renovators, he knows what needs to be done. 
He knows, see the things that we talked about in the last five weeks. He knows what must be done. He carries a vision for it. He inspects the foundations. He begins with the clearing of the rubble. He inspires the people in Jerusalem to work together to get the work done. And I'm jumping ahead, but the, the people begin to work on the walls just outside of their own partially rebuilt shanty homes. There's a chunk of wall that's been knocked flat, and so they go out and they take responsibility for that section of the wall. And there's, this is all recorded in Nehemiah, how different communities around Jerusalem said, we'll take this section of the wall. We'll build it from this gate to this gate. Someone else said, we'll take the gate. We'll restore the gate. We'll hang the gates. Someone else said, for my family, we'll take care of this section of the wall. And it's there in the scripture for you. The entire building process is it's laid out. Here's how it's going to be done, and here's who in, who's in charge. And they do well. Working shoulder to shoulder, the walls began to take shape. But you see, when the Jews were cast out, their government was cast, everything is, is swept away and regional powers had stepped into that power vacuum left by the Jews who had been deported and they didn't want to give up their power. They were, although they weren't doing anything with Jerusalem, they didn't want to see Jerusalem become a regional power again because they knew it would affect them. And so they were against the Jews rebuilding the wall. They were fine with the Jews being there and living in hovels and worshiping in their somewhat diminished temple, but they did not want to see them rise up to greatness as they once had. And so they began to work against them with intimidation with interference, with mocking, with threats of violence, with distractions and plots. We need to understand, you see, that life is not merely physical and emotional and relational struggle, it's spiritual. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, blood, the Bible tells us. We are engaged, whether you feel like you're engaged or not, you have an enemy of your soul who is working against you all the time working against the plan that God wants to unpack in your life through interference and intimidation and mockery and fear and distraction. And if you look at it, you say, I don't know why the devil hates me. Why should the devil hate me? I've been pretty much living for him most of my life. Why should he hate me? Maybe you don't say that. A couple of you ought to, but I'm kidding. I'm no judgment. What kind of judgment? Anyways, why should the devil hate me? Have you ever thought about that? I have a lot. Why does he hate me so much? It's because he's the, he's the devil, he's a demon, he's evil, they're, they're evil, and so nothing good in them, and so you, know, I, you wrestle that whole thing around, and one day it hit me. It was just clear as a bell. It kind of answered the question for me. I, this one just doesn't even dwell on my unsolved mystery schedule any longer. You know why the devil hates you? He hates what God loves. And God has displayed his love for us in such a measure that he has sent his own son to die for us. The enemy knows that we are the reason. We are the joy that was set before the son before he came to earth to die that we might be redeemed. The enemy knows that God loves people. And so he hates what God loves. And when people who he has destined for destruction... He's quite happy with that. When those destined for destruction come to a newness of life and then begin to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, he recognizes that now he just has another adversary. So the enemy works against you constantly. And some of you look at me like this is fairy tale. This is reality. You're living in the fairy tale. Nehemiah got off to a smashing start. His great challenge was in keeping the job moving though was all of the threats and the intimidation and the size of the job and the weariness well read it nehemiah 4 10 through 14. in judah it was said judah's the tribe of judah in that whole region of jerusalem okay so it's in the region it would be like me saying in north carolina it was said in judah it was said the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing there is too much rubble by ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemy said, they'll not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. 
At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. So in the lowest places of the space between the wall and open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords and spears and bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. There's four voices here. Four voices. And over time, these same vo four voices speak. I'll bet, I'll bet you will recognize these voices. First of all, the people, the workers, that's you and me. They said, our strength is failing. There's too much rubble. We're not strong enough. Then the enemy said, they won't know what hit them. We're going to kill them and stop the work. Then their friends and family said, stop, come back home. Finally, Nehemiah said, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord and fight. So let's listen for a minute and see if there's anything familiar in these four voices. First, the first voice is the voice of the people, the voice of Judah, saying, it's too much. You been there? It's just too much. In Judah, it was said the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. We are, by ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. Have you been there before? That moment of utter defeat? I'm not going to be able to make this work. Too much rubble, too much destruction. We don't have the strength. Well, let's step back for a moment and understand this. Reconstruction is always messy, messy, messy work. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to bring us into the fullness of God's plan for us, it can get a bit messy and overwhelming. Overwhelming. This is normal, but often it distracts us to the point where we quit. It's normal. We can handle the rubble. We can handle the, we can handle, we can, but we don't because we give up. When I was in Bible college, while I was home during the summers, I worked for a bridge construction company. Same company every year would just come home and pick up where I left off the year before. Same, same crew, except for one year I worked for a different crew foreman. He was totally different. One of the uh, bridge construction foremen that I, I worked with was highly organized. His name was Harold. Harold didn't get excited about anything. Harold was just very low key. Harold moved slow. Harold was deliberate. Harold was organized. Harold had a quiet authority about him, but he was, he was that kind. The other one was not. His name was Dale. I worked for Dale for three years and Harold for one. I mean, one, of the, one of them had rules about the 55-foot trailer that sat on our sites that was filled with all of the gear. Harold had rules about the trailer. Dale was in too much of a hurry to worry about that, always in an infernal hurry. Harold was easy to work for. Dale went through workers like water. When I was working for Harold, he had one rule, one rule. We clean up every day. Now, this is a bridge construction crew, and believe me, we wreaked havoc. We made messes. Some cases we were doing new construction, in more cases we were doing bridge overlay, and it was just sloppy, messy, stuff spread all over the place. But when you work for Harold, at the end of the day, everything was picked up. Everything was cleaned up. Clean up every day. Don't let anything get out of hand. Put everything back. Coil everything up. Hang it, sort it, whatever. Clean it up every day. I learned from watching Harold, wonderful leadership principle, that I haven't employed. I just walked into my study this morning and it looked like a bomb had gone off in there. I was working on a project this week that ate up about two and a half days and I mean, it looks like somebody just went in and pff, wiped shelves and it is a disaster. It's gonna take Carrie all day tomorrow to get it cleaned up. <laughs> Here's what I learned. 
Whatever you let lie about in your life is going to be a bigger problem for every day that it goes unaddressed. You don't pick it up now, you're going to throw another layer on tomorrow. And everybody right now who has a stack of clothes laying on the floor at home, you know it's not one generation. There's the stuff you wore back in the 70s during disco under there somewhere. You're going to find a pair of bell bottoms if you just go deep enough. And now you can't even get in. What happens with hoarders? They just begin to stack it and they never clean anything. They can't let anything go. And before long, they're a reality show. If you let it lie around in your life, it's going to be a bigger problem for every day that it goes unaddressed. There's something here for us, friends. The people looked, there's some, something else. The people looked at those massive piles of stones and said, this is too much. But in those piles, in those stacks of rubble, were the stones that they needed to rebuild the wall. Don't miss this. The broken ones could be reshaped, recycled, reused. The raw material that they needed was right there in the pile. God always starts with what you have, even if all you have is wreckage. I feel like I could go home right now because that's what I, I, I just feel is so important to say to someone here this morning. He always starts with what you have, even if what you have is wreckage. You say divorce just absolutely gutted my life. It's what you have. That's where God starts. That's where God starts. You say, I look at all of the bits and pieces of, uh, of my life that have fallen down and it surrounds me and I don't even know where to start. I'll tell you this, God starts with that. He doesn't waste anything. Have you ever heard testimonies of people who say, I went through this, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me, I wouldn't wish it on my, on my, my worst enemy, I don't want anyone to ever have to go through this, but let me tell you what God did through that. Because he never wastes a thing. And so the people were looking around saying there's too much rubble. And they were literally looking at much of the resource that they needed. And abandoning it completely saying it's, it's just too much. Well, that's where you start. He always starts with what's in your hands. Moses, he says, Moses, what's in your hand? Well, it's a stick. I want, you to, I want you to understand, Moses, that what I've put in your hand, that walking stick that you're carrying around, I want you to understand that it's more than a stick. No, it's a stick. Uh -huh. it's, it's more than a stick. It's a st cast it down. Okay? Cast it down, it becomes a snake. Don't you love that story? And Moses just jumps off the ground. You know, he's got his sandals on. and I mean, he's almost out of his sandals going, wow, snake. I don't like snakes. Anyone else? I don't like, I don't like snakes, and I don't understand people who do. I don't like snakes. And so you've got, you got all of that going on, and that became the sign. He, he told Moses, he said, what you need to do, you say you don't have the right gifts, you don't have the right talents or anything else. I put that stick in your hand, and I'm going to use it in a powerful way. You walk in before Pharaoh, and you throw that rod down on the ground, it turns into snake. You watch what happens. What's in your hand? Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to feed these people. He says, do you know how many people are out here? That's Peter, Andrew. Do you know how many people are out here, Lord? Peter, what? <laughs> Just see it. And Thomas, I, 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 doubt, I, I doubt it. We can really feed these people. What have you got? Andrew comes and he says, well, there's some loaves and a few fish. Actually, they're, they're not fishes. They're, they're chunks of, of bits of, of fish. They would, they would catch the fish. They would salt it and dry it in migdal. And when the fish was, was dried out sufficiently, it would be pulled in pieces. It was kind of like pita chips. And for a little boy who was following the crowd, and Mama wanted to make sure that he had something to eat, he would basically get a few of these chips. Not fish and chips, but he would get basically these, these little chunks of, of fish to take along. So it's, it's not like there were these three fishes and Jesus... No, it was just... it was. It was just the flesh that could be pulled apart into pieces. Dried out fish. What have you got? Fish. And Jesus asked the disciples, why don't you feed these people? We don't have anything. Well, what do you have? 
Well, I got a few loaves and, and fish, but what's that for so many? You see, it's never, it's, it's never whether it's big enough or whether it's strong enough or whether it's deep enough or whether it, it costs enough. It comes down to this. What is in your hand and will you yield it to the Lord? Will you use what you've got? Will you, look at the, will you look at the rubble and say, the stones that I need are in here. I'm going to dig just a little bit deeper and find a good one, but we're going to put this wall together over here. See, if you'll stop pining and whining about what you don't have and begin building with what you do have, the mountain of rubble will soon be a bit of dust that you can sweep up and carry away. But if you quit, if you quit. Well, and the workers were weary. The scripture says they were weary. Anybody here ever been weary? Anybody got a good weary story? I am a weary story. I'm the poster boy for weariness. Anyone else been, been there? You just like, oh, enough. I've been tired to the point of despair in my mad pursuit of this terminal degree. They call it a terminal degree for a good reason. I've wanted to quit. I've wanted to take the pressure off. I've wanted to breathe a little bit from the, all of these deadlines that keep looming. But I knew and I know I was called to do this. And so I can't quit. But I do get weary. I've been wearied in the pastorate. You say, I, I haven't watched you all these years. I've never seen you weary. You're just not close enough. See, it's been, almost, it's been 42 years since I was called to this, 38 years since I stood behind my first pastoral pulpit. I'm fast approaching my 2000th Sunday. Forgive me if I use an illustration that I used once before. <laughs> it's been a lot of Sundays. Weary? Who has not grown weary? But Isaiah says, they that wait upon the Lord shall, there's that word, renew. Those that wait upon the Lord will be renovated. They'll renew their strength. Weary, we all get weary. So the children of Israel were weary. Secondly, their enemies, their enemies came along. And what did their enemies say? You're going to fail. Our enemy said, they'll not even know or see till we come among them, kill them, and stop the work. No shortage of doubters in the world. There are long, long lines of people who do not believe in you. How many of you agree with that? There are long, long lines of people who don't, agree, who, who don't believe in me. Yeah, we got doubters. There are people also who will, they, they will prophesy your downfall. My favorite story is the one right after. I was in, in Bible college my senior year the last guy you would choose to be a pastor because I had had a checkered experience academically and in my whole, whole college experience. And suddenly I wake up one morning in March before I've graduated and I have said yes to a pastor at I are a pastor. And the word kind of trickles out across campus that I said yes to this little church where I actually am the pastor. And some were supportive, three, and... The rest, it kind of went like this. The thing that hurt the most at the time, I'm over it now, but the thing that hurt the most at the time is one of the professors that I was very close to said, and then a friend came and told me because they overheard it, he'll last 18 months. And 38 years. He'll last 18 months. And I, I, I don't fault my professor at all, because I've doubted people too, and I've been dead wrong. Nehemiah had bureaucratic interference, threats of violence, subtle intimidation, plots of ambush. You look around and say, I, I don't have enemies like that. But you forget the scripture says that your enemy, your adversary, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You do have an enemy like that. In the sixth chapter of Nehemiah, he receives an emissary from the regional governors who are against everything that he's doing, saying, look, you need to come down and talk with us. Let's negotiate this thing out. We can, we can work these things out because there's some charges we're about to make about you that you're not going to want us to make. It was pure intimidation. And I love Nehemiah's response. Nehemiah's response was, I'm doing a great work here and I can't come down. You have to say to the enemy, God's doing a great work here and I can't come down. I won't listen. Doesn't the Bible say resist? James says resist the devil and what? He'll flee. That's resist the devil, not assist the devil. Resist the devil and he will, he'll flee. Then there's friends. 
there's friends. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us 10 times, you must return to us. You see, a number of the men and women who had streamed into Jerusalem answering the call to rebuild their capital city and rebuild the walls were the people who had been out in the countryside. They'd lived in villages all around Jerusalem and in the valleys and up in the Galilee. They were, they were skilled people all over the place. And when they heard Nehemiah's come to rebuild the walls, they said, we are in. And they came in droves and they began to, they began to work and the walls were coming up quickly. But all of a sudden, they started getting word from home. Hey, you're missed here. Hey, you need to come home. You've been gone too long. It's been 30 days. They had the opportunity to be a people again, a nation again, a family again, but the messages are trickling into Jerusalem. Come home, come home. You've done your bit. You're needed here. You've done enough. Someone else can do it. Sound familiar? Have you ever felt like you're pulled between priorities and you know that there's that one thing that you should be doing, but there's so, and you just can't say no. If you don't learn to say no, you'll never really say yes. That's distraction. Listen, the, the renovation God wants to accomplish in you will suffer more from friendly distraction than from hostile attack. The renovation God wants to do in your soul will suffer more from friendly distraction than hostile attack. See, I can resist the adversary, but I'm not very good at resisting a friend. Priorities will make you or break you, and if God's work is a very low priority, the work will stop. Paul said, he who began a good work and you will be faithful to complete it. Don't pack up yet. The work's not finished. And then Nehemiah spoke. And look at what he said. Remember the Lord. I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord and fight. So after Nehemiah gives his speech, the people filter back. They filter back to their positions around the wall. Let me just pick one out. I made him up. His name's Moshe. Moshe's come from a village up in Galilee. He's a tecton. He works with stone. He's like Jesus. And he's been working on a section of the wall, living in a little lean-to over by the Jaffa Gate, working with the priests there. His youngest son is walking at his side. He's dirty and he's tired. He looks at his boy who's walked for days to bring a message from his wife. And the message was simple. Moshe, just come home. And he thinks about the fear that gripped his heart the night before when he looked out through a low place in the wall and he saw the torches going back and forth out there and he wondered, would this be the night that they would come? He's a carpenter. He's a tecton. He's a stoneworker. He's not a soldier. He remembered his heart seizing up with fear. He looks at his swollen hands. Under his breath, he says, I haven't slept in 36 hours. And he just wants to lay down. And as I bring this message to a close this morning, I want to talk to the one who just wants to lay down today. The rubble, the weariness, the fear, the distractions, the voice that says you're already a failure. You're not. Because God's not finished with his work in you, not yet. Don't be discouraged by the mess. It contains the raw materials of your success. Don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We are made now more than conquerors through him who loved us. He won't allow you to be tempted past that which you can withstand. He provides a way of escape. 
Stop listening to the lies of the world that say you're done. It's over. Quit. Be, walk away. Turn your back. Stop even listening to those voices and start filling your heart with what the Scripture says about your life and your future. Look, it was never going to be easy. That's why you've got to fight. You have to fight. But if you'll fight, he'll finish. If you'll fight, he'll finish. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We ask that in these moments, you would challenge our hearts, even as we survey the rubble and the broken places and the distractions and the intimidations, even in those places where we don't believe in ourselves. We bow before you today and we pray, oh Lord, come and speak to us like Nehemiah spoke to the people. Let our hearts be open to receive it that we might go back to work and see your work fully accomplished in us. Whatever it takes, whether we're in demolition, reconstruction, or revisioning, or working on the foundation, whatever it takes, bring us to completion, Lord. Work in us. We ask it in Jesus' name.